Uh, you know, there's a certain expectation if you uh, watch any team sports, uh, whether on TV or in the bleachers, cheering on somebody, which is uh, certainly more fun. Um, but, you know, before the, b- depending on the game, but to, before the hand, uh, before the clock starts, you know, the teams will often gather together, they huddle up, circle up, depending on the sport, what you're going to call it. And they're going to gather together, and they're going to get an emotional pep talk, right? And, um, and then they're going to break from there, and they're going to split out to their positions, whether offense or defense or uh, wh- whatever the case might be. And so um, we kind of expect that, right? Or if you watch a concert, uh, think of a, an orchestra or a, a high school or middle school concert, uh, or even a, you know, a concert of a, of a you know, contemporary Christian artist or whatever the case might be, right? They're going to gather together, uh, probably talk about things, or, or maybe they they just kind of make their way out into their respective seats, right? Whether first chair, first chair, second chair, third chair, you know, instrument that they might be. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, there's this is odd thing that happens with the orchestras while we're on the topic. You know, they get, they get out there and everybody's trying to finally, you know, tune their instruments. Um, and so that's like the worst part of the whole thing. It just sounds terrible. We're like, if, you know, if you didn't know that was the process, you'd walk in and think, what have I gotten myself into, right? Um, but, uh, they get out there, they begin to tune their instruments, and they're all a little bit out of tune, but right at the end, they just, just comes together in this unity, right? Wouldn't it be weird, though, if they, the sports team gathered together, and, and, uh, and, and they huddled, and they had their pep talk, and, they, and then they all ran out with the same energy and passion. They all went to the exact same spot on the field. It's like 12 people, 11 people, or depending on five people, or depending on your sport, right? Nine people. They all ran out the same position, same spot. All right, let's do this. Right? The batter's at the plate, and he's like, man, lots of openings out there. The orchestra came out. They all came out with piccolos this day. Be like, okay, this is either going to be really good or absolutely terrible. You know, God has built the body of Christ to be different. We've, we spent last week speaking about the unity that we have in Christ. The very fact that God sent his son Jesus to redeem a people for himself and, and has tore down the wall between those that were opposed to each other, brought them together. He has created a uni- unity. And we saw last week that we are called to maintain that unity. We're not trying to create Unity, and that's very important for us to understand. We're trying to maintain or preserve and and put a spiritual sweat into maintaining or preserving that which God has created. And so Paul moves in verses 1 through 6 through uh, introducing that idea to us, or really filling it out, what he starts to explain earlier in in Ephesians. And then he breaks here. Uh, Let me me just read what we read last week, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That means everyone in this room who names the name of Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior has one God and Father and Spirit who is over us and through us and in us. And so he gives us this, these, these uh, keys to church growth or church maturity in the pure sense of what it means that de- uh, to develop the members of the body of Christ. And so Paul moves from last week speaking strongly about this unity, and then this morning we'll see that he talks about unity through diversity before bringing it all back together to speak of that unity again. So let's ask the Lord to open the eyes of our hearts uh, to, to both understand and, and then understand with our hearts what this means for each one of us this morning. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we we exalt your name, Lord. We saw this morning as we sang that we don't deserve to come to worship you. We stand before you simply because of the blood of Christ, able to worship you with our whole hearts because of what Christ accomplished on the cross for us. This morning, Lord, we ask that you, you who are the, the giver of all good gifts, uh, help us with a, a particular understanding for this particular grace that you give your children, uh, that we might maintain the unity of the body of Christ through the incredible wisdom that you have and that you've 
demonstrated through deploying your people with a diversity of gifts and passions and purposes and pursuits. But all of those align as we seek to build up the body of Christ. May you receive all of the honor and praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles if you don't have them open already, or a Bible app, Ephesians 4, uh, 7 through 16, we'll read this morning. Ephesians 4, 7 through 16. The Apostle Paul says, but grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. And therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Notice the parentheses there. In saying he ascended, what does it also mean but that he also descended into the lower regions of the earth? Or into the lower regions, the earth. He who ascended is the one who, I'm sorry, he who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning and by craftiness and deceitful schemes." And rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Jesus Christ gives varieties of gifts that are to be used for His purposes, right? Varieties of gifts intended to be used for His purpose. So each Christian, when someone repents of their sin, Christian or little Christ or Christ follower, means I can't work my way to heaven, so I'm going I'm to repent of my sin. I'm going to turn away from trying to be the king of my own heart, and I'm going to acknowledge that Jesus has done it all for me. He stood in my place at the cross, and I believe that that's true. And when a person makes that profession of faith, the Bible says that we're justified, and in, those mo- in that moment, God equips us. He gives us gifts that are enabling grace in the exact proportion that he seems or, or, or determines to be fit in the way that he measures it out, right? And, and that's complicated for us because we like to compare ourselves to others. I mean, we don't have to work very hard at it. It just sort of uh, happens because our hearts uh, love to be looked upon well by others. And so we compare ourselves to others and we think, oh, this guy is better at that or this lady is better at that or whatever the case might be. But that's not the point. The point is God is saying, I, I am uniting all things in Christ, things in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And I am building up my church, the body of Christ. And in order to do that, I need to give certain gifts to certain people for certain seasons, for certain calls, And God is wise in doing so. So he introduces this concept here. Uh, Notice the the contrast, but, but, I'll find it here so I can say more than just the word, right? Uh, But grace was given to each one of us. You don't see it in our English translation, but in the original language, there's the word the there or the article, but the grace was given. So it means it's a particular kind of grace. It's not a saving grace that God talked about earlier in Ephesians. This is a particular kind of grace relating to the way that God through Christ has given out his gifts right? Grace here means this special ability, or you might even say a a supernatural ability to perform the task that God calls us to. Listen to how other passages of Scripture uh, speak about spiritual gifts. There are are five main passages in Scripture. We're going to look at at two of them briefly, Romans 12, 3 through 8. And and I'll tell you, I'm going to read through these quickly to draw out the main points uh, so we can see this variety of gifts, and then I, I got to keep moving. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, it's going to be hard not to preach each one of these texts, so I got to keep going. But Paul says, uh, for the great, by the grace given to me, 
I say, so by the grace given to me for Paul's particular calling, I say to every one of you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Why? Well, see, here I go. Because God has given us grace, which is undeserved favor to be able to, number one, be his children, and number two, live for him, expressing the gifts, gifts that he has given us. So think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and, me, uh, and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. So in the same way that our, our salvation should lead to just leagues on top of leagues of humility, so ought our gifts that God has given us lead to humility. Not for pride of place, uh, not for posturing, uh, not to be able to be visible and upfront. And I tell you, I am I'm incredibly thankful uh, for the humility of those who serve the Lord here at Oak Grove Church. Sometimes we will thank people, or I'll thank people, or we'll thank people in front of others sometimes, right? Not for accolades, but it's good to recognize those who are serving, because why? Well, it's a demonstration of, of the, the activity of God at work in a person's life. And, and most frequently, uh, you know, we thank people, even if it's just one-on-one, -on -one, and, and they just kind of shy back and say, no, 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 it's not, it's not me. You know, that's exactly right. Now, it's okay to give thanks. It's okay to, really, what we're doing is we're thanking the Lord in front of that person for the way that they're living and walking in faith right? But there's a humility that says, no, it's almost, I'm not, I don't want to do this for myself. Sometimes there's just a reality. That humility is a sense of like, you know, if I lean into this too much, I might just like it. The thanks, the attention on me, you know, so there's a, a genuineness and humility, but also maybe a, just an awareness of our own tendency if we're not careful. And, and that's what Paul is saying. Don't, don't think more highly of yourself than, than you want. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 14 says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. You notice how this theme of, uh, of variety and unity are interwoven throughout. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord, varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given the spirit and the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same spirit, and to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by one spirit, to another working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to, st to distinguish between spirits, we might call that discernment, uh, to another various kinds of, of tongues or languages, to another the interpretation of tongues or languages. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions, similar to what we read here in Ephesians 4, uh, 7, 8, who measures it out uh, according to each one individually as he wills. For just as the, one bo the body is one and has many members, all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one Spirit we are all baptized into one body, Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, slaves or free, we were all made to drink of one spirit, for the body does not consist of one member, but of many. So the point is this, each of us has received this enabling particular grace in the exact proportion that Christ gave it. Now you may say, I don't know that I know what my gifts are. Well, you need to practice what you think your gifts might be. If you're not practicing your gifts, you don't know what they are. Maybe you need to be taught to understand or discern what they might be, but it's still going to involve practice. And we begin to affirm what that is or understand what those gifts are as we practice our gifts, and then we see the fruit of the Spirit working 
as we go along our way. We see the body of Christ affirm, yeah, that does seem to be your gift. Unity isn't the, as I was talking about with the sports or music analogy before, it doesn't mean the uh, sameness or a replica of a person or a personality, right? And that's the challenge for us. We want to be like this teacher or, or this servant or like this church over there or like this other individual that's gifted in that way, but that's not how God designed us. God called for, for today, every one of us is here at Oak Grove Church in Shellsburg, Iowa, because God is doing something here at Oak Grove Church, and He's doing wonderful things. Sometimes we see very publicly what they are. Sometimes we don't see because there are a lot, there's a lot of discipling going on in the backgrounds, and God has called each Christian, each, uh, each member uh, or each regular attender that should strongly be considering being a, a member of our church in mutual accountability and service to one another, but I digress, but not too far. <laughs> Each Christian committed to Oak Grove Church and through the Lord Jesus Christ is called to exercise their gifts, not to try to be like others, but to exercise their gift as God uniquely created you. And let me tell you what also goes along with that. Exercising your gifts with imperfection where you are in your relationship with Christ. Because if we wait until we're perfect, well, we'll die first. You see, you serving with your gifts does not disable the Lord or handcuff the Lord when you make a mistake or sin even in the process of using your gifts. Why? Well, because the Lord is progressively making us a little bit more like Jesus. We call it progressive sanctification all the time. And that includes when we strive and we, we do well. It includes when we strive and from our perspective, we, we don't seem to do as well. Or somebody gets on our case because we did something wrong according to their perspective. The Lord is using all of this to build us up in the faith. Our individual grace of gifts has been uh, an has an incredible origin. Now, this is a really uh, interesting and a quite perplexing passage in verses eight through ten. But he goes on to say that not only do we have a particular or special grace, but our individual graces have a an incredible or a, a spectacular origin, right? Look at verses 8 through 10. Therefore, it says, so it is referring to the Old Testament, Psalm 68, 18, which he quotes with a, a minor change here. He says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean, that he, but that he also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above the heavens that he might fill all things. So in, in verse 7 of chapter 68, uh, God is pictured as, um, as marching in victorious triumph before all of Israel after the exodus, after he, he freed his people from slavery. And so when he comes to Sinai, the earth shakes under his feet, verse 8 tells us. And then in 11 through 14, kings and armies are described as those who flee before him while his people sleep peace of peacefully by their fires at night. Why? Well, because they're resting in their victorious king who also watches out for his people. And then toward the end in verses 16 and 17, from Mount Sinai, uh, God sets his sight on Mount Zion. So he moves from Sinai, Old Testament, to, to, to Mount Zion and moves with tens uh, of thousands and thousands of thousands of chariots up the slopes of Jerusalem in victory, leading captives in his train as, and receiving gifts from men. And so Paul, uh, I, I think I forgot one thing. So you, you picture these captives, these individuals that were captive to another Nathan, nation. The king has fought the battle and he has won them back. So he has won them back in order to deploy them for his service of his own kingdom. You see how that works? And so what has happened in a New Testament sense, Paul has, um, he changes the line from receiving gifts to giving gifts. So the triumphant Christ Jesus by faithfully living a perfect life, dying on Calvary and being raised from the get dead, he's victorious. And then he came and he walked on the earth and then he ascended from the earth. 
So the ascended, victorious, victoriously risen Christ is giving gifts or has given gifts to men. And so Paul applies this beautiful imagery in Psalm 68 to Christ's ministry of of giving gifts and and his incarnation. We think of his virgin birth and his perfect sinless life, sacrificial death, burial, resurrection, and ascension. John 3.13 clarifies a bit. It says, no one ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Jesus came to earth. He, He set aside... Oh, man. He set aside everything that was his to take full advantage of as God. He was 100% God, so he didn't set aside his identity or who he was, his nature, but he did not continually take full advantage of his omnipresence as God, being always present everywhere. No, he, he, he laid it aside for the particular ministry that he was called to or given to us for. But then he bursts up with exaltation and he fills the whole universe as a conquering king, joyously giving gifts to his children. And these gifts come with this enabling grace. That means you can't do it on your own, but God through the Holy Spirit, that's why they're called spiritual gifts or gifts of the Spirit, God through the Spirit at work in you enables you to develop and walk with the fruit of the Spirit. I know the fruit of the Spirit are different than gifts of the Spirit, but the same idea is true that when we're walking with Christ, we're able to deploy and use the gifts that God has given us, exhibiting fruit of being with Him. Exhibiting fruit that testifies to who we are as His children. So what are the graces that He gives? Well, we see a list of these, you know, I, I mentioned earlier, there are five lists of, in Scripture of spiritual gifts. Uh, each of them are kind of summary, um, summary descriptors, if you will. But in this passage, Paul, spoke, Paul speaks of, uh, of four in particular. So Christ gave leaders to equip Christians for ministry. Christ gave leaders to equip Christians for ministry. Verse 11 through 14 says He gave the apostles the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers, two, that's a purpose statement, two, equip the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Well, why? Until, or building up the body of Christ until, how do we know when we're built up? Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood. So we're striving for maturity, not, not good enough. We're not striving for I'm sure somebody else will do it. There's plenty of people there. I have more important things to do. No, we're striving for maturity to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Why? Well, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So there's four types of gifts that the apostle Paul speaks of here. Two are for the initial building up of the church. And two are for the ongoing expansion and building up of the church. So he speaks of apostles and prophets. And quickly, apostles and prophets are foundational gifts to the church. Right? We saw earlier in, in Ephesians 2.20 that in chapter 3, verse 5, that the apostles and the, the apostles were the twelve, and the prophets were those who, who preached kind of in, in conjunction or complementary to the apostles. We also know about the Old Testament prophets. Uh, both of these roles, apostles and prophets, came from a, a declared authority from God, which is now encapsulated in the Word of God, in the 27 books of the New Testament. We also, of course, include with that the 33 books of the Old Testament, 66 books of the Bible. So the first of the gifted men in the New Testament were these apostles of whom Jesus Christ is the first, first uh, and foremost apostle. He is the capital A apostle. It simply means one sent on a mission. But the Bible uses the term apostle or apostolos in in a particular way to help us see that these were men of authority sent to establish and initiate the church in its early New Testament times. And so uh, there there were some criteria for 
someone being an apostle. They must have been chosen directly by Christ, which is why Paul is the last, but, but he says no, no, not the least of the apostles, but the last of the apostles. Uh, why? Because on the road to, get to almost said Gethsemane, on the road to Damascus, thank you. On the road to Damascus, Jesus himself called and appointed the apostle Paul. That's why he opens his letters. I'm an apostle by the will of God. God made me an apostle. And so I'm acting under God's authority, under Christ's authority, to declare Christ's message with authority. Apostles preached and proclaimed and taught and led and shepherded and discipled and disciplined with the authority of God. Second, they must have been a witness to the resurrection. And uh, Pastor John MacArthur says that the apostles were like delegates on a constitutional convention. Once the convention is over, then the position ceases. When the New Testament was complete, the office of the apostle ceased. So, so we don't believe that there are ongoing apostles in, an, in, an, in a title or office sense. Now, we often speak of, since the word apostle means one who is sent for a particular mission, we often speak of those who are apostle-like. Church planners are often th- thought of as those who are, are apostle-like, if you will. There are casual terms in the New Testament of the word uh, apostle, too. But uh, the word uh, apostle, the apostles and the prophets had these basic foundations of, of uh, laying the foundation for the church, receiving and declaring the authoritative revelation of God's Word, and giving confirmation uh, of that Word through signs and wonders and miracles. There were unique, unique things that happened in the New Testament times that were uh, these miracles which were intended to say, I come with the authority of God, and this is how you'll see it as we work these miracles, or as God works these miracles through us. Commentator F.F. F. Bruce says, the apostles at a, as an order of the ministry of the church are not perpetuated or were not perpetuated uh, or carried out beyond the, the apostolic age, but the functions they discharged uh, don't lapse or stop with their departure, but they continue to be performed by others, notably the evangelists and pastors, teachers. So the third and fourth positions that we see are pastors and teachers, or I'm sorry, evangelists and pastors, teachers. And that's how I understand that text to read. It says, uh, pastors and teachers, there's only, before each one of these, and you can see it uh, without getting in too much of the grammar, right? You see the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. And so this is is really like a pastor-teacher role. Right? Evangelists continually speak of the message of Christ's salvation. The term's only two times in the New Testament when Philip uh, brings the message to the area between Jerusalem and and Gaza where he meets Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch. And as as he's kind of trotting along in his carriage, uh, this guy comes and he says, hey, I've heard all these things. A very loose paraphrase here, by the way. I've heard all these things, so can you explain it to me? He says, yes, I'll explain it. He says, well, I believe it. What keeps me from being baptized? And he's like, hey, let, bro, let's do it. Stop, stop the train. Hop off. And he baptizes him, and then they continue on their way. And as a kind of ministry that Paul exhorted Timothy to perform in 2 Timothy 4 or 5, he says, as for you, speaking to Timothy, be sober-minded, enduring suffering, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Some Christians have the gift of evangelism. It just oozes from them. They can't not talk about Jesus. It's good. They're going to find doors for talking about Jesus, pathways to getting uh, uh, from whatever the topic is to Jesus. I used to play this game with my youth group kids just to help them see how creative they can be in taking everyday conversation to spiritual things. You know, we used to call it like Jesus in three or Jesus in five or Jesus in one for the pros in the room, right? And it was just like, I'm going to give you a word. Maybe it's a color. That's like the low-hanging fruit there, right? Or maybe, uh, maybe it's something else. And you've got to get from this general topic to Jesus in three pivots, right? It's kind of a fun game. The point was just to not be that awkward in life, right? I mean, that's just kind of can drive people away, but to help us realize that, you know what? When I'm passionate about the things of God, it's actually not that complex to get from conflict to Jesus.
to get from relationships to Jesus or they don't like me to Jesus. And so it was a fun little challenge that we did. Some of them really struggled at it. Some of them couldn't quite get there. And some of them were just like, bam, like every time we're like, they're going to be an evangelist. They've got the gift of evangelism or whatever the case might be, right? But that doesn't free us. Some of us say, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Well, we're still all called to evangelize. There are just some that are uniquely gifted for that particular purpose. An evangelist would, would not only preach the gospel, but he would, he would help us learn how to do it better. Those who want to grow in our ability to engage others with the truth, he'd help us grow in doing it better. Pastor, teacher, uh, the word pastor means a shepherd, and, and it's a metaphor for one who is to shepherd people, one who cares for people, one who helps others watch their step, one who helps others guard their steps so that they don't what? Well, so that they don't trip and fall over our own life and sin choices, so that our own, over our own decision. The pastor teacher is one who, who, who comes alongside them to, to help them in that way. This is the only place where this is used as a noun, pastor. The rest of the time, it's used, it's used in the term of shepherding the flock among you. So that idea of being a pastor shepherd, a pastor teacher, that's how we shepherd. That's how we care for people, by taking God's Word, helping other people unfold it and learn how to put it into practice in everyday life. Some people will say, well, I just can't, I just can't live that way. Well, that's just not true. The Bible says that uh, God has given us everything that we need for life and godliness through the knowledge, which means the intimate, growing communion and fellowship and relationship of Him who called us by His glory, by His excellence. Remember, He's the risen, ascended, victorious King who called you, who saved you. You don't think He can then equip you for the thing that He's called you to? No. What that really means is, I don't care enough about it to want to do it. Now, there's, that's a continuum, right? So there's, there are times we, we strive and we fail, and we strive and we struggle. And Paul would say, keep striving. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work it out means you're saved. Now work it out. How? Well, according to the ways that God has told us in the Word of God, which means to sit under the preaching of God's Word week in and week out to be in relationships where there's it's really kind of a, a three- or four-fold relationship there that everybody needs a Paul and everybody needs a Timothy. You need somebody that's further along in the faith than you are. They don't have to be a genius, just further along in the faith than you are. They don't have to be on staff at a church, just further along in the faith than you are. And then you need a Timothy. You say, oh, I can't have a Timothy. Well, that's what your Paul thinks. I don't know if I can disciple him or her. I don't know that I'm, I'm equipped for it. Well, this passage here says, you know, something like I beg to differ. First, first, first uh, Peter 5, 2 kind of brings all of these three terms together. Uh, Peter instructs the elders to be good bishops as they pastor. So he, he says, so I exhort the elders or this is uh, presbyteros among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as, as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd, that's the verb form of the noun pastor. Pastors, pastor, pastors, shepherd. This is the verb form of that word. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. That's the third word. I think I skipped it a minute ago. Um, Episcopeo, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, and not for shameful gain, but eagerly. In Acts 20, verses 17 through the end is a beautiful passage where Paul, toward the end of his ministry, calls the elders. He says, guys, come. And he gives a wonderful charge. We don't have time to read it now, but he gives a wonderful charge to these people pastor, elder, teachers, overseers, for how to carry out their ministry. Now, why is all of this happening? God, verse 12 tells us that it is that God's purpose is to equip Christians for ministry. We love the noise of children. So I just want you to know that, wherever you are, whatever you're thinking. Do you know why? Because when we're gathered together as adults or children, grandparents, and and uh, parents, and then children, and anywhere in between. We grow together. We grow up in Christ together. And so we're, we love having children in here. 
We're to be equipped for the saints. I'm sorry, equipping uh, Christians for ministry. This is what pastors and teachers and evangelists are called to do. Right? You might say, well, that's my job. Uh, it's going to sound a little weird, but and I wouldn't quite go this far, but you might say, well, my job's not to do the work of the ministry. It's to equip you to do the work of the ministry. Now, when I say my, I mean myself and the other elders that I serve with. Now, we ought to be, how do we equip you for the work of the ministry? By taking you alongside of us as we do the work of the ministry, we equip you to do the work of the ministry. We get together, we fellowship together, we teach you, we teach you what the Word says, how to understand your gifts, and how to use your gifts. You have the responsibility of faithfully working in service for the Lord. Does it all happen within the context of church-organized ministries? No, not necessarily, because you're a neighbor, and you've got family members, and you've got friends, and you get to use your gifts and deploy them in service to others. And the point is, he goes even further in verses 13 and 14, we're to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, that's verse 12, uh, until each, until we all, and you've heard me lay out my amazing Greek skills before, right? In the Greek, you know what all means? All. That means everyone that is a committed member, regular attender of Oak Grove Church, is to use your gifts to build up the body of Christ. Your gifts to practice them and, and flesh it out and struggle through it. Everyone. That means there's not really, you ought to feel a little bit I mean, I say this with love because the end goal is that we mature as a body of Christ. But you ought to feel a little uncomfortable if you're, hear my heart here, if you're coming in and you're sitting here on Sunday morning and then the next time we see you or see you engaged in using your gifts to build up the body of Christ is the next Sunday morning. In fact, you might not actually be using your gifts for building up the body of Christ to grow to maturity because maturity happens when we practice our gifts increasingly, a little at a time. God doesn't say, meet together once a week and then dust off your Bible next Sunday morning. <sighs> time to go to church. Actually, I wish. Yeah, okay. Um, that's a sideline. Bring your Bible to the church or you open your phone and have God's Word open as we're reading it. Why? Because we're into the things of God. We're into how God speaks. We want to understand the truth of God's Word as best as we possibly can. And so when each Christian uses his or her gifts, the church matures. Sometimes, occasionally, I have people share with me about what they think about what's going on in our church and different things, and sometimes I'll just say, now, how are you serving in the church? The goal isn't simply to end the conversation, though it usually does, but <laughs> I'm not trying to be unkind. It's really easy for me to play Monday morning quarterback. But guess what? I ain't in the pros. I don't play on any team. I, I observe. I, I, I sit down on the couch sometimes and I turn on the TV and I watch those who are gifted, who are professionals, although drop the profession, professionals part for this analogy, play the sport well. It's really easy to sit back and say, oh, that was a terrible call. What a terrible throw. How'd you even make it in the NFL? The worst players in the NFL are leagues better than all of us. If you're offended by that, you needed to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and pastors, teachers are, 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 the, are the coaches who say, okay, guys, come on, let's, let's get together. We're in a game. Actually, we're in a war. And every one of you have a unique, particular grace that God has given you, that He has called you to. And this church, this body of Christ, which is part of the larger capital C church, will be incomplete and will be immature unless everyone is doing their part. Now, this is a two-part sermon. We're going to come back next week and flesh out more of what that means. I hope everybody shows up eagerly, but I want you to hear, and I don't think I have them on the screen here for you. Oh, yeah, no, I don't. But I want you to hear, I'm going to read uh, 14 through 16, uh, 13 through 16. Paul says, until we all 
attain to the unity of the faith. That means we need to have a right understanding of what the gospel is. Well, I believe in Jesus. Well, so does Satan. He's not going to heaven. Well, I want to be saved so I can go to heaven. Well, if it's just about not going to hell, then you don't, you don't love Jesus, you see. We need to know this. We need to be able to confidently uh, uh, share and explain what the gospel is. So until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Boy, you see how he just drives that in? So that, why? So that we're not children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. And rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, you see this body imagery, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. The victorious, risen, ascended Christ has equipped this body with every joint. And there's a lot of pain when we're out of joint. But there's nothing like having that thing pop back in. I mean, it's painful, but then it's glorious. This is what Paul's calling us to. Friend, this is a wonderful vision. We saw it this week with uh, 80 or so kids in VBS and 50 plus leaders. Some were up front. You know, Caitlin was on the stage dancing to the music and, and showing everybody the motions and the instructions. We had group leaders. We had folks in the kitchen which really don't want to be seen by others. And we're saying, we need you to come into this room so that everybody can see the body of Christ at work. I'm not bringing you into this room because it's about you. It's about Jesus. Everyone that served in the body of Christ, working as teachers in different stations, handing out drinks, serving with crew leaders, just being extra and available is the body of Christ when we all pitch in. Now, that doesn't mean we all have to do everything, but sometimes what happens is some people teach, and, and with the best of efforts, we say, oh, if you, could you teach for this season? And what do we often hear? Uh, I don't know. Why? Because we all know that not everybody's doing their part. We all know that not everybody's who's able to teach is teaching. And they know that if they sign up for it, even though it's not our intention, they might be teaching for 15 years. <laughs> See? Exactly. Been there, done that. This could, this could sound like a, a really big guilt trip. It's not intended that way. What's intended to say is, brother and sister, if you're a child of God, you don't know the beauty and the fullness that often comes with hardship, but that hardship turns into joy as we see God fulfilling His promises to teach us and sustain us and make us more like Him. You don't know that if you're not using your gifts. And so it's a joy to be able to use your gifts for building up the body of Christ. And I just want to tell you, you're missing out. I don't want you to miss out. I want you to experience everything that the victoriously risen and ascended Christ intends for you through the particular grace of gifts that he's given you. As we take communion, we have the privilege every week of remembering what Jesus did on the cross. And I want you to ask that question this morning. As, as I, a professing believer, if you're, if you're not sure you're a Christian, this really is a time for Christians. And we just encourage you to, to remain seated and, and, and pray in your seat or, or even as we're moving around, because we'll invite you to come forward to either this side or this side. And we have two servers that will be in the back. This is a wonderful time to grab somebody else that you know. You can talk during this time and ask somebody, you know, I'm not sure if I'm a Christian. I know a lot about God and the Bible, but I'm not positive if I'm a Christian. This is a very appropriate time for that. You may want to sit in your seat and, and just quiet it, quietly, somberly repent of some sin. Repentance is wonderful worship. But as we do that, recognize that the very bread we eat and, and, and cup we drink was from the Savior who would later ascend. And He bought for you and for me 
the joyous ability to serve the church of God. And we recognize we go through seasons, and so I just want to ask you to, to be asking the Lord, Lord, in this season of my life, in this season of my life, where do you want me to be serving you? And help me to be faithful by your particular grace in this area to be doing just that. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful word that you've given us. And Lord, I pray that you would give us your wisdom and insight. It's not like a game of hide and seek. You want us to know the ways that you're calling us to serve you. And so, Father, we pray that you'd help us to understand it and be faithful in serving you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.